I think the good news is that we're kind of a small and perfectly formed room. Do you guys want to come from the back seats down? Sorry to make you to move. It's an option. You can, you can come closer if you want. Um, just so we're a, little, we're a little tighter. You can sit there? You absolutely can sit there, please. It's a shame to be in a confined space like this and to have so much distance between us, which I think is going to be a metaphor for this next issue. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm Neil Dunn. I'm the chief executive officer for a UK-based company called Polymateria. We're based out of Imperial College in London, the iHub. Um, for those of you who are here from academic circles, no doubt you've seen how much Imperial have been investing in spin-out disruptive technologies over the last couple of years. And when the iHub specifically was launched, uh, it was kind of heralded as being a green Silicon Valley um, just outside London. So we are one um, of the exponents of that. But I don't want to spend so much time today actually talking about Polymateria, the business I run. Um, I'll dwell on, dwell on it a little bit. I thought it would be much more useful for you to just hear some of my observations around plastic as an issue and how it has captured the public mindset like nothing else I've seen. And it has awoken us in a way that the hole in the ozone layer didn't, carbon emissions didn't, methane emissions didn't. And I think it has become emblematic of society's um, odds with the biosphere, how humanity are uh, we're ultimately not in harmony with nature at the moment. And the visible nature of plastic, whilst carbon is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, uh, methane is not odorless, as, as you will probably know, um, but the hole in the ozone layer was something that I think for the first time we started to think about how the carrot and the stick could be used together to unlock innovation within business to, sh to solve a big environmental issue. So going right back to that particular issue, um, it was uh, becoming quite clear that the, the hole in the ozone layer was expanding. CFCs were clearly part of the problem. Um, a lot of the big businesses who were using CFCs in their products at that time had big lobbying groups, public affairs groups, who were all in Washington basically arguing um, and disputing the science and saying that uh, the hole in the ozone layer doesn't exist. If it does, it's probably getting smaller as opposed to bigger. And CFCs have little or nothing to do with it. Until one of those businesses actually figured out how to replace CFCs with a technology that wasn't harming the hole in the ozone layer, and they could actually do it at a cost that was comparable with CFCs. And that organization's called, does anybody know who they are? DuPont. So Linda Fisher, who was the Chief Sustainability Officer for DuPont, um, approached sustainability as an innovation challenge. And literally within a couple of weeks, DuPont were back in Washington, arguing for promoting the technology, um, supporting the science, being incredibly alarmed about the hole in the ozone layer. And you know what? A couple of years later, the hole in the ozone layer is starting to close. And I think that was almost like a taster. That was an appetizer for what was about to become come later. What came later was, um, for those of you who have been uh, observing climate change and being increasingly concerned about it, we had in Copenhagen in 2009 an opportunity to come together, business, civic society and government to come together and to start to architect a world that was um, putting a cap on carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions and starting to engage markets and starting to get some coordination within civic society and set policy frameworks within government that would allow us to um, all move forward in the same direction. Didn't happen. I was in Copenhagen and I think the scar tissue from that lived long in, in the memories of people who were there. We failed abysmally. We failed for a couple of reasons. One, the narrative was one of negativity. Um, we were doing a lot of doom and gloom, and we were using a lot of shock tactics to wake people up. We also didn't have a lot of disruptive technologies to point to. Solar was not yet commercially available. It wa wasn't yet the big success story. 
We didn't have Elon Musk and Tesla. We didn't have things to point to to say, this is what we need to get behind. This is what new technology looks like. We had um, technology like Project Better Place. Those of you who know what Project Better Place was, it was effectively um, uh, almost like a precursor to Tesla. It was a guy called Shia Gassi. He was very like Elon Musk in so many different ways. Um, but the, the, the technology was incredibly complicated. It was all about trying to solve the issue of battery costs and having um, almost like a, a, a drop-in, drop-out technology where you could drive into a gas station, um, drop out one lithium-ion battery, plug in another one, and basically pay for that as a service. So it was incredibly complicated, incredibly difficult, and ultimately the business failed. But in Copenhagen, that was our poster child from industry. That was the thing we were pointing to. And we're also pointing to wind and solar, but there was a lot of challenge around can it cost in, uh, can it scale, the variability of renewable energy as a, as a source, we weren't yet um, really, really dealing with that at a kind of a systems level. So we failed in Copenhagen, and a lot of us came away and licked our wounds, and we learned from that. But boy, did we learn. Um, by the time it came to Paris in 2015, there was a whole other attitude to how we were going to actually approach that particular moment in time. The narrative was positive. It was one of can do. And that flowed across civic society, business, and government. It unified us all together. We were also much more on the offense around the bottom up activation. So we were doing an awful lot more to apply pressure, upward pressure on the political system. Because we started to, I think, learn from Copenhagen that unless people were holding their politicians to account and effectively saying, we want policy change, we want markets to be engaged, we want business to be held accountable, and you are our representatives, we want you to go to Paris and get a positive result. And that was architected. That was something that civic society came together on, particularly in the environmental space, like nothing before. And then civic society also engaged business much more effectively. So all of the big business-facing environmental NGOs, the likes of the Carbon Disclosure Project, um, CLG, Cambridge Leadership Group, and others, all put aside their differences and their disparate agendas and came together under a, a banner called We Mean Business, which was all about the business case for climate action and saying that this is good for business, it's not bad for business. There will be stranded assets and there will be some that will be left behind, but you always have that when markets evolve. So We Mean Business were well-funded. They were backed by um, deep pockets from Ikea and others put money on the table and said, you know, we really want this to be, markets to be positively engaged in, in Paris. And then the final thing was the power of French diplomacy. Um, and if I was to point to one, singular, one single person within the whole French ecosystem, uh, it wouldn't be right at the top. It would be to a lady called Laurence Tubiana. And Lawrence Tubiana knew how to work the system in the background. She knew how to pull people together. And up until Paris, she'd run an NGO um, like most other civic society leaders. But by really working with government and using French relationships, that was one of the reasons why, with those other factors, that 197 countries all came together and said, we want a world that's only going to warm to a maximum of one and a half degrees. So that is probably to this day the most powerful case study that we have around dealing with big global issues across all different sections of society. And that brings us to the present day. And uh, the last 12 to 18 months in particular. And having worked in this space all my life, so before I ran Polymateria, I set up sustainability within Accenture, I um, had my own business for a while, I did the uh, chief sustainability officer role in British Telecom, but it's always about commercializing solutions to big global and environmental issues. And plastics is now at a whole other level of awareness, as I was saying at the start. It's kids are identifying it as an issue. Um, media have latched onto it like nothing else that I've seen. Um, and the net result of all of that to date has been we're kind of demonizing plastic. We're looking at it as, as, as a great enemy and actually pointing to it and saying, we have to now start switching to banning straws, switching to cardboard, uh, switching to more sustainable sources, switching to bio-based plastics. 
And what I'm seeing in the, in the landscape of people who are getting concerned by this issue is huge awareness, but it's repeating a lot of the same mistakes that we made before we were effective on CFCs and the hole in the ozone layer and before we were effective in Paris. But technology companies who have solutions or can point to small parts of the solution, these are small disruptive businesses like Polymateria, we're all at odds with each other. We're all fighting about whose technology is best. So there's a lot of this going on, not a lot of this. A lot of the um, environmental NGOs have started to become incredibly fragmented. If you just want to do a small exercise, go online right now and look at plastic pollutions oceans on Instagram, Twitter, social media, and you will just see in any one region about 40 to 50 different small NGOs with some small backer all doing a huge amount around advocacy and awareness raising on this issue. And there's no, there's, there's no real coherence across the whole, the whole um, civic society side of things. Big business aren't even at the table. So as we stand here today, what date is it today? So Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's Day. How could I possibly, being Irish, ask that question? It's the 17th of March. And this year, 2018, we're probably going to produce, if GDP keeps going the way it's going, somewhere in the region of half a billion tons of plastic this year. And ExxonMobil and Chevron and a lot of the big back-end polyurethane producers all made a statement a couple of weeks ago about spending hundreds of billions in investment in plastics technology over the next couple of years. That industry is not stopping. That industry barely even knows there's an issue. We're heading right now where we stand for a billion tons of plastic to be produced every annum um, within the course of our lifetimes. Banning straws isn't enough. Bioplastics isn't enough. We need to start looking at the same approaches that had us achieve a positive result in Paris to now sharpen our focus and look at how we're going to deal with this issue. The first thing is we need to be clear about the scale of the challenge. This is a billion ton issue. Just like when we started to um, figure out in about 1981, 82 that the world is warming as opposed to cooling, we then, we then were able to kind of set the goalposts out and say, well, what's an acceptable, over the next couple of decades, level of warming? Is it acceptable to warm four degrees, three degrees, two degrees, one degree? With plastics, we need to be really clear that this is a billion ton problem. And then we need to be able to actually look side by side in all the different swim lanes at all of the different solutions. And we need to be able to compare like for like. And by that, what I mean is looking at the capital costs of all of the different technologies that we could point at this one billion ton problem and say, what can we afford to do today? What can we afford to do tomorrow? What can we afford to do long term? And as we evaluate each of those technologies, not just to look at how it performs in terms of taking plastic out of the global system, but actually full life cycle analysis. I think those of you who've kind of been following the various different knee-jerk reactions to dealing with carbon emissions have seen us do things like um, ba you know, promote diesel engines because diesel engines by the UK in particular were seen as being more efficient than, 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 than petrol engines. And then a couple of years down along the road, we begin to realize, hang on a second, diesel, diesel is way dirtier than petrol ever was. Now we've created a whole other problem. We need to start banning diesel and looking at electric vehicles. So full life cycle analysis is, is incredibly important. And the reason I say that is one of the big sources of the solutions is our bioplastics. So de decoupling from the petroleum-based feedstock and looking at what uh, cassava starch and, and seaweed and other things do we have an abundance of that we can actually scale commercially to replace certain sources of plastic right now. And there is huge, huge potential there. But the limiting factors would be when you do full life cycle analysis on bio-based plastics is that there's a huge water issue. So water is an incredibly scarce resource. And if you look at things like um, fracking and you look at coal and other um, energy intensive technologies, 
all of them have a big dirty secret, which is that they're incredibly inefficient from a water perspective. They all take incredible tonnage of water to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity. So you could get obsessed about the carbon story, maybe the methane story, but you'd miss the fact that there isn't enough water in North America to frack all the gas that there is in North America. So you need to be clear about that and you need to put a ceiling in place around the potential of that technology and bioplastics are similar. The second issue, and both of these issues can be overcome by the way, so I'm not saying they're limiting, I'm just saying that we need to have the facts on the table when we consider how we solve this billion ton problem. The second issue is that bioplastics don't biodegrade at the moment. Um, we're finding them 10 years later, still almost perfectly intact, floating around in the oceans in the world, and they haven't been properly assimilated by the natural system, by the world around us. So that's a, that's a big issue. Um, that can be overcome, but we need to be clear about the limitations and we need to be clear about the capital costs. And then probably where the biggest capital outlay is. So I think um, if I was to relate what's the corollary of the hole in the ozone layer for the whole plastics issue, it's probably oceans plastic. People are, are, are fixated on plastics in the oceans um, but if you go back to the, the point I was talking about earlier, heading for 500 million tons of plastic this year, it's about 8 million tons of plastic is winding up either in rivers, next to rivers, in oceans, um, and there's only one piece, two pieces of research that have properly looked at this. So people are fixated on that and have, have, have also focused in on the fact that it's coming from, that 8 million tons is coming from pretty much exclusively, by exclusively about 95% from 10 rivers. Eight of those rivers are in Asia, and two of them are in Africa. So we've really focused in on ocean plastic, but there's a massive land-based plastic fugitive littering issue. In fact, about 30% of that 450 million tons at the moment is what we call fugitive. It's escaping the system. It's winding up outside of a recycling facility, and it's being littered on land, and, and it's only a small percentage of that that's making its way into rivers and making its way then into the world's oceans. So recycling facilities, scaling up recycling facilities, mostly in the developing world where those 10 rivers are, is a big capital outlay. And the thing that we don't know at the moment is what is the capital cost of doing that? The World Bank at the moment aren't at the table. A lot of the governments that sh should be thinking about this basically don't have the money. China has the money, but Vietnam, Philippines, Cambodia, they don't have the type of resources that you would need to scale up recycling facilities at a municipality level, at a regional level, and also promote a lot of the behavior change campaigns that need to go in place to basically stop using rivers as landfill. So again, we need to be clear about the limitations there, and we need to put those facts on the table. So over the next couple of months and couple of weeks, what I propose we all do, because this is, um, I'm suspecting a room of people who actually want to take action on this issue. You don't just want to hear from me and, and kind of go away and maybe send a tweet or two. I propose that we start coming together, and I propose that we start pushing our governments and pushing business and pushing charities to come together just like we did on climate action. And that when we do, we all need to work incredibly hard over the next two or three years to understand what is the capital cost of solving a billion ton problem. And how does that capital get divided across all of the different, let's not say competing solutions, but collaborative solutions. And how do we then understand maybe some of the li limitations of each of those things and how do we under overcome it. Because when we did that with, with climate change, there was um, an initiative called the Cost Curve Abatement Methodology, where in 2008, 2009, Tony Blair commissioned a piece of work that McKinsey did to do that exact piece of work um, for climate action. And that was the moment that we started having the type of facts, the type of commercial logic, that allowed business to come to the table because we could look at the cost of a particular abating technology and engage markets and also set policy that allowed us to point things in the right direction. And I propose over the next couple of months that we all start to hold the people who are able to do this to account and we start looking to see can we learn from the success of Paris in 2015 
and apply a lot of that same logic to how we're actually solving for plastic pollution. And one thing I will say, and this is going to be a little bit provocative just right at the end because I'm, I'm, I'm actually keen to maybe spend about 10 minutes doing questions, is that there will be a tendency to demonize plastic. And I want you to be aware of that. Plastic does incredible good in the world. It preserves food and it gets water to places and to people that would not otherwise have access to it. So plastic is not bad all of the time in all instances. The issue with plastic is the end of life phase. Because it's so cheap, because it's so durable, because there's about 50 years of cost-based innovation that's gone into it, we've created a whole other problem, which is it lasts forever. And that's the problem. So whatever we come up with in terms of solutions, we need to solve for the end of life phase for plastic. And we need to learn from the most powerful circular economy we've got, which is Mother Nature, around how to do that. What does Mother Nature need to properly assimilate and break down plastic so that when it does wind up in the natural environment, we're actually able to process it and deal with it, have it biodegrade, have it compost? And I would imagine that when this work is done over the next couple of months and years, that one of the most cost-effective ways to abate the biggest percentage of the overall billion-ton problem is actually, is actually to be able to um, help polymers biodegrade and have bacteria attack them and break them down in the natural environment. And we should be really clear that a whole other standard is involved to allow that to happen. This is not about fragmentation. A lot of people will tell you that we can break it down today, but actually a lot of what we're doing today is just fragmenting the problem. So we need to push the European Union, we need to push every government minister to say, what level of molecule, what does this polymer chain need to be broken down to so that enzymes and bacteria can properly deal with it and let's set standards for that so if any of this stuff escapes, 30% of it is at the moment, Mother Nature can properly deal with it, properly break it down. And um, I think that is probably going to be one of the big quick wins that we can all mobilize around, get industry at the table around, unify NGOs around, um, and then we can start looking at some of the medium term and longer term challenges. So thank you for your time. Um, I do want to take questions. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, and just hear your ideas around this particular issue and if there's any other way I can help. Um, over to you. There's microphones going around here. Hi, thank you for that. Um, when you talked about the 30% that's escaping and when you mentioned Africa and Asia, um, in terms of cost for recycling, is it maybe better or some percentage of the solution to have people reuse over a longer period so that they're not throwing, you know, they're not, people treat plastic consumably, but it's not really a consumable. So maybe there's a way to stem that by reusing, and that could be part of the capital investment strategy. And I don't know if you've done any cost analysis that that might be and more sustainable over the long run or as you get these recycling plants in these yeah. remote areas going. Yeah, absolutely. The question is how many, how many, so if you think about a fully circular economy, somebody who, who um, let's take Unilever as an example, so, so single-use plastic that is then getting used to make stronger roads, stronger infrastructure, and it ultimately gets buried and doesn't become an environmental issue, that's a great second life for plastic because it doesn't wind up being, being fugitive. So that's an easy business case to make. There's an awful lot of, um, if you've watched the Plastics Oceans movie, uh, the, the, blue, um, not the blue, uh, blue Sphere Foundation uh, Plastics Planet movie, it's incredible to see how innovative people are around using plastic as sources of heat, um, um, buildings and so on, but only really getting another second life out of it. So the re reuse phase is, um, is quite dangerous in a lot of ways because it might get used once, then winds up in the natural environment, or they may be burning it and, and breathing in the fumes, um, or making jewelry out of it and, and damaging their skin and so on. So I think we kind of need to be careful about exactly what reuse systems are, but the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, absolutely are a big part of how we'll solve this uh, billion ton problem. What was your name, sorry? 
Danielle, thanks for the question, Danielle. Yes. Hello, my name is Vusani Bafana from Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm interested to find out what can we learn maybe from international conventions like the Montre Montreal Protocol as well as the Paris that would be good to actually get our leaders to then come up with policies because I think you need to give them the carrot towards yeah. policy making than actually the stick. This is brilliant. This is exactly what we need to do. We have no uh, Montreal Protocol for Plastics. We have no COP, so the, the COP process that we ran for 20, 21, 22 years now on climate action. We have nothing like that on plastics. So one of the challenges I'd be putting out there is to say which government is going to step up first globally and have a Zimbabwe protocol for plastic? Who's going to do it? Who's going to be the first leader to pull everybody together and to then continually revisit progress and impact um, over the 20 or 30 years ahead? So I think this as an intervention is probably the one, one of the most powerful things that could possibly happen. And if you're influential in Zimbabwe government circles, um, feel free to take that idea and run with it. Hi, my Hi. name is Alina. Um, I'm from Malaysia. I'm a teacher. Um, and, and I find myself creating a lot of content around plastic and, and doing exactly what you said, demonizing plastic. Um, so in my own locus of control, um, I have this group of young kids that I could influence if, if I were to, if you were given that chance to have that perfect lesson for secondary school students, how would you do it in your own classroom? That's a great question. Um, I have to do that every day with my kids at home, a uh, six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, are incredibly curious about this whole issue. And they do exactly what you're saying, which is that they, they focus in on replacing with glass or banning the straw. That's the easy thing to do. And I do think we need a lot of that. And it's really hard for kids to relate to, but there's a billion tons of this stuff. But I think engaging their mind and their curiosity and, and also just volunteering, I think picking it up within nature. So the, the shires of England are littered with this stuff. I mean, talk about the oceans and David Attenborough pointing at the oceans, but when you cycle or you run in a B road in England at the moment, you just look along the side of the roads, plastic, 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 every, and nobody's really talking about it. So we go out and we volunteer and I actually think the best lesson is to kind of almost go out and extract plastic with kids out of nature and just stack it all up and look at it and then say, now what do we do with this? Um, is that polypropylene? So that's a, you know, that can be recycled. Polyethylene, that can be recycled. PET can be recycled. Um, Norway is a very good case study of um, very effective, efficient PET recycling where 90% of PET produced is reused over and over again, but they had to come together, government, municipalities, and business brands, all to kind of agree what are the two sources of PET that we're gonna use, and then everybody knows what to do with it when they see it, um, and there's consumer bring back schemes and so on. So I think the perfect lesson is probably go out in nature, find it, and then sort through it, and then say what currently can we do today to, to process it, and then what will good look like? And then maybe look at Norway and say, well, gosh, they did that really well. Can we actually lobby? Where are you from? Malaysia. Malaysia. Can we lobby? Yeah, I mean, Malaysia, that's, that's where it's at. I mean, if you guys could get your government to say, here's actually how we're going to do things differently at a systems level, that would be a game changer. I guess my question is from... What's your so name? I'm Kyle. Kyle, hi. Kyle, hi. So my question is from uh, sort of the business perspective. Uh, how you tackle this sort of momentum? You said there's 50 years or plus of plastics research, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and you learn about every type of plastic, uh, but you don't hear the word bioplastic in school. Uh, the textbooks, the education, how do you change the behavior of engineers um, and people who are using the, you know, who have to make a business decision to use a specific type of plastic. Um, so what, what I'm doing on that from, from you know, the, the hat that I wear um, is, is actually going to a lot of the big plastic conventions. You're from America? Yeah. So there's one in Orlando on the, the week of the second week in May where the whole plastics industry come together just outside Disneyland. I mean, you couldn't make it up. And they look at all the different kind of exciting plastic technologies and it's 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 uh, it's hyper consumption you know gone gone crazy and really this year is the first time that there's a, a responsible sustainability aspect to all of that and they're starting to think about it but it's very much on the margins so so the kind of the 
the type of leadership you need here is really all around coalition building. What I'm trying to do in Orlando is get the Sierra Club and Greenpeace, so Annie Leonard, who did a lot of the stuff with the story of stuff, National Geographic, who have people like uh, Enric Sala, the explorer in residence there, to kind of come together and let's say, let's actually invite business in to a round table session. And, and share some of the campaigning stuff that National Geographic are going to be doing in June, share Greenpeace's concerns, share others, and just have a fact-based conversation around the, the need for change and to start trying to break down some of those, some of those walls that exist, exist between them at the moment. And then you, kinda, you need some kind of collateral or research that frames it in commercial terms in a way that business can engage. So, so that's kind of what I'm doing, and you know, if that's interesting to you, <laughs> you're welcome to join in. Great. So I'm being told to stop talking, which as an Irishman is really hard to do, particularly on St. Patrick's Day. But thank you for your attention uh, and your time, and, uh, and do enjoy the rest of the Global uh, Education Skills Forum. It's a fantastic event, and I know you're going to see many more great sessions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for that question.